Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is Steve Wilson uh, at the Illinois State Water Survey. And uh, if you're on this webinar, it's to um, it's for Well Care 101, what you need to know to protect your family. Uh, thanks for attending. And uh, this is a uh, part of the private well class, which if you're not familiar, I'll talk about that towards the end. But um, the Rural Community Assistance Partnership and the US EPA uh, are partners in, in this effort. And um, we're funded through RCAP, who has a grant from US EPA uh, to provide resources and support for um, private well owners, which hopefully uh, is why you're here today. First off, these courses or these uh, webinars are also available to sanitarians or environmental health professionals for uh, credit towards their continuing their, their license. And so I want to make sure that if you're on as a EHP and you're a NEHA member who's looking for um, hours, this webinar was delivered on in June, back in March, and last December. And so it's only good um, once every two years, depending on when your credentialing cycle is. So the example here, if your credentialing cycle ends at the end of this month, then you could take the same uh, course again anytime after 10-1. But if you've already taken one of the other three, um, just be aware that you cannot get credit for it twice. Um, if you are looking for CEUs, um, there's a, a copy. Uh, we can provide those three things that are listed there. And I believe, Katie, you put uh, the attendance CE form on for NEHA in the GoToWebinar uh, handouts, correct? That is correct. If you click um, on the handout section in your GoToWebinar application, it should be there in PDF form that you can download and fill out and send to us. Yeah, and if you are an EHP, I know like in Illinois, um, they want their REHP credentialing uh, through some of these. Then you may need a copy of the slide deck, um, and we can certainly provide that as well. Just email us. All right. Uh, so today, as I mentioned, um, this, the funding for this program comes through RCAP um, and EPA. And the materials today follow parts of the lessons of the private well class. And if you're not familiar with that, it's an online 10-lesson course that's free that um, walks you through what it means to be a well owner and how to be a good steward of your well and things you can do to help protect your family from risk. So um, I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but I want to mention all the partners here. And uh, here at the University of Illinois, it's, it's ran through the State Water Survey. So um, there will be time at the end for questions. Um, most of you who registered asked questions, or some of you did. We hopefully will answer those on the webinar today. We've actually made slides up for those. But if you have questions that come up during the webinar today, as far as something that I've said that you have a question about, or you know something pops up that you want to ask, um, there is like a question or chat box on your GoToWebinar panel that you can type in there. Katie's going to monitor that, and then um, she'll summarize those, and at the end, we'll, we'll go through those questions if there are any. All right? Um, so today what we're going to talk about is basically uh, things about your well, how to keep it safe uh, to drink, uh, some maintenance best practices, and as I mentioned, we did receive a number of questions from uh, folks who registered, and we'll go through those. Um, I'm a groundwater hydrologist at the State Water Survey. Um, Katie is here, is also at Says the Water Resources Center. We need to update our slides. Um, Katie is now uh, here at the State Water Survey as well, and she's going to field the questions, as I mentioned. And we also um, have Dan Webb with us, who's the head of our public service lab. Illinois is fortunate to have a, a university lab like our public service lab that until 2011 or so, I believe, any well owner in Illinois can get their water tested for inorganics and metals for free. And uh, now there's a small charge for that, but it provides us, me as a groundwater hydrologist, a lot of information about the groundwater quality in the state um, that we can use when we're working with well owners and, uh, and that sort of thing. So uh, Dan will answer all the water quality related questions later on and, uh, and if you have any others that come up as well and help to answer the questions that we've um, have provided on slides here at the end. Okay, so the thing to remember as a private well owner, um, they aren't regulated in 95 to 99% of the country. There are a few places now where there are some regulations, uh, particularly related to sale and transfer of a property. 
But in general, um, once your well's been installed and it's been initially tested, uh, a new well, then you're on your own as a well owner to make sure it's safe and to test it. Uh, there's no, it's not like a community water supply where the Safe Drinking Water Act dictates that uh, they have to sample regularly, they make sure that the water's safe and, and those sorts of things. Um, the other thing to remember is that you can't always determine that your well water is safe or unsafe just by looking, tasting, or smelling it. A lot of times uh, contaminants can be odorless, colorless, and have no taste. So um, I grew up on an old dug well, 15 foot or 14 foot uh, deep brick lined well in a cattle pasture. Um, but now I live in uh, Champaign-Urbana in uh, Savoy uh, area. And uh, so what I pay every month for my water uh, as a community water supply goes toward all the 150,000 people or so that are on uh, Champaign-Urbana's water supply. And that pays for the infrastructure, the piping, all the folks who test it and make sure it's safe um, so that when I turn on my tap, um, I've got water pressure and I have water that comes out of my tap. Um, you are responsible for all of those things as a, as a private well owner. And it's, uh, so it's a really a responsibility and it's something uh, not to take for granted. And uh, a lot of folks do. They just assume that their water is always going to work and uh, not understanding how their well or their pump work. And then when something goes wrong, um, you know, it's always at the worst time is what I found growing up. Um, when we I ran out of water, it was always, uh, well, there's never a good time to be out of water. It's the bottom line. So um, some considerations about your well. Generally, a deeper well is better uh, just from the standpoint of it being farther from the surface, so less chance of surface contamination. That's not always true. Um, it depends on how much casing there is. It depends on um, whether there's any natural occurring contaminants. There are some geologic formations that have natural occurring arsenic or uranium um, or other things that are just part of the, the general geologic makeup of the material that makes up your aquifer. And in those cases, obviously, um, you may have to, a great water supply, but it may have some contaminant in it. Um, location in the landscape, especially for shallow wells, these are more important. Um, the example I like to give is if you're in a rural subdivision where there's 12 homes and it's sloping towards some really beautiful scenic river, the person who's farthest upstream on a land surface, water's flowing in the water table down towards that river. So if it's all shallow wells and shallow septic, um, the person who's farthest away probably has the water running from his house down through everybody else. And so the further you get down those, down that street, so to speak, um, there's more chance of shallow contamination of groundwater. Uh, in the same way, understanding groundwater flow direction, um, you can be very near even a landfill, but if the flow direction is towards the landfill from your house, then you're not going to have any effect from anything that might seep into the ground there. So understanding your flow direction of the groundwater, if that's possible, and in some areas, especially for a larger aquifer, um, likely your state water or geologic survey or USGS um, or your Department of Natural Resources, some of those folks may have mapped water levels and understand the flow direction and they can probably give you some help. And then just understanding the area around your well. Um, what do you have nearby? If you're right next to a gas station, understand that there's um, underground tanks full of gasoline uh, below the concrete there, or um, there used to be something here 40 years ago and now it's gone. Um, you know, just being aware of what uh, is in the area. And again, if you have a fairly shallow well, or especially a dug or board well that's shallow, uh, surface influences matter more than if you have, you know, a two or 300 foot well that's got 200 feet of casing so that the water's coming from, you know, below that casing. So um, just things to be aware of uh, as we move forward. Um, another issue is poor construction. So every state but two have well construction codes now, and those two states would be Pennsylvania and Alaska. Um, but even states like Illinois that passed well construction code rules in 1968, there are a lot of wells that are older than that, and they were all grandfathered in. So the well I grew up on was hand dug in 1933 by my grandfather, and so um, it's not safe. Uh, and it never, you know, it never was. When we had uh, heavy rainfall, our water was cloudy. So, you know, surface influences 
actually were there. And before the uh, advent of the pitless adapter, many wells were put in pits, especially in northern climates where there's freezing soils, um, so that your water wouldn't freeze. Well, many of those wells still exist today, or at least some folks are still using wells that are in pits. And, you know, those are a risk not only because uh, a pit can fill up with water and contaminate, uh, get into the well and contaminate it, but it's also a safety risk. And we see a lot of cases where um, a well is not properly protected at the surface. It's a large diameter well, and uh, someone has fallen through and gotten hurt or killed, um, which I'll show you some examples of. So uh, there's also many hand dug wells that are still in use. I know the well I grew up on is still in use, uh, even though it probably shouldn't be. So understanding the type of well you have, um, where your water's coming from, and if you have a well that's in a pit, and even if it's a four or five or six inch uh, well, you know, our recommendation there would be to, to bring that up to the surface and fill that in. There's no sense having a well in a pit these days. Um, it just creates more uh, potential for, for problems. So here's some examples. Uh, the upper left is a large diameter well. You can see it's a corrugated metal uh, casing. Uh, this, this is from the Washington State Department of Ecology. They have a blog, and in Washington State, the Department of Ecology is who oversees their private wells, uh, well construction code, and driller uh, licensing programs. And so they have a blog where they provide information about wells fairly regularly. Um, this is a few years old, but, you know, that piece of plywood's probably been there for a long time. You can see there was a concrete block that covered the whole uh, the pump is just below the surface there, and it caved in, and she fell in. But, you know, you can see there's a broom in the upper corner and a, a funnel sitting there, and it looks like insulation all around. Um, just not a safe way to have your well. There's probably stuff floating in that well, uh, all that sort of thing. And so not having your well properly sealed at the surface, uh, certainly spiders, uh, rats. Uh, we've seen a lot of things, including the picture on the upper right. Uh, that's a goat that fell into an old dug well. And so, um, you know, uh, just having it open where those things can happen um, is, is asking for trouble. It's not protecting your health, all those sorts of things. And the picture at the bottom, that's from here in Illinois. Uh, my boss, Walt Kelly, took this picture. We did a study of a bunch of uh, dug and bored wells. And so the difference, the, these large diameter wells, these old wells, some today are still bored with a boring machine but they're, sealed, they're constructed in a way that meets construction code and is much more safe. This old well at the bottom has two by tens over top of the, the brick and then some tin over top of that with some concrete blocks. Those pieces of, uh, of those fence posts that are there, um, not only to hold up the electric box, but the reason they're all slanted and all worn down is because that's a cattle pasture. And you can kind of see on the far right, there's some hoof prints there in the mud. Um, so those cattle use that as a scratching post. And so they're also doing other things there, and it's right next to the well. And so you can imagine, um, you know, the, the odds of that well not having coliform or E. coli contamination are probably pretty slim, especially after a big rainfall event uh, where water is seeping into the ground and pulling that down uh, with it. So, you know, those folks uh, that lived on this well, uh, that's the barn up there over the hill you can see, uh, They've always used the same well. They like the water the way it tastes. And in a lot of cases, our situation is trying to convince people that even though they maybe drank it for a long time, it's not safe. And it's not safe for others. And it could eventually lead to, you know, there's access here to the well. So if something gets spilled, that's, you know, a, a cornfield just up gradient, so to speak. If there's a large spill up there, it's probably going to end up in the well. Um, you know, all those sorts of things that are just really unsafe. So what should you do? Um, if you have a well in a pit, you should extend the pipe up to the land surface and fill it in. Use a pitless adapter if you need that in a, a cold climate. Um, you know, talk to your well authority, your county health department, or a contractor. Find out what they recommend. Talk to your neighbors. Uh, find out if anyone's had any issues. You know, that's one thing um, I notice now growing up on a small farm in central Illinois is that even though we had this old dug well that clearly wasn't safe, it was in a ravine and water could run into it from the surface, no one ever talked about their well water quality being poor. Um, if I, when I went to college, after I was away from our farm for even three or four months, 
and and we had to start drinking uh, city water, so to speak. If I drank the water at our house, it made me sick. And that's because I grew up with the bacteria in my stomach. I got used to it. But then when I went away and, and that stuff went away, um, I no longer could drink that water. And that's, you know, pretty telling for uh, the type of well that we had. So um, but my, I guess my point there was even my dad always swore that our well water was better than city water because it didn't have chemicals in it. And I understand some people don't like the taste of chlorine. Um, but it's there for a reason. Uh, it's because having a little chlorine taste is a lot better than having E. coli contamination that can make you really sick or even, you know, kill you. So uh, it's an acute problem to have if your well's not properly protected. Um, the other side of this is abandoned wells. You know, many private well owners are in rural areas where there may have been an old well or they bought a property and they've installed a new well, but there's an old well they're still using for you know, for the garden or for livestock. Um, we know from working with all the well records, and in, in Illinois, the State Water Survey houses all the well records for the state. So we have um, a file room with nearly 500,000 well logs, and we believe that's probably about half of the actual wells that are in use in the state. The others are from wells that are prior to where uh, logs had to be filed by law. So because of that, there's many more undocumented wells on file, as it says here, and there's a lot of old wells that never were properly sealed. Uh, there are safety risks. You saw the goat um, and the lady who fell in the well. Um, but if you have one of these wells on your property, not only is it a potential source of contamination to the shallow aquifer, but it's also a safety risk. And if you know someone were to, were to be on your property and fall through an, an old well uh, into a well and get hurt or killed, um, you will likely be liable. And so the best thing to do um, is to fill those in if, um, if possible. And here's some examples. Uh, again, these two pictures are both from the um, Washington State Department of Ecology from their blog. One is a horse that's in a well or they're trying to get it out. And the other is uh, a man fell 45 feet into a well and, and he was fine. He ended up, uh, there was water in the well. Um, and he didn't get hurt, he just had to be helped out. So very fortunate. Um, these four newspaper clippings, three of them are all from Illinois, and they're all from the same year. Uh, the third one, though, is from Jessica McClure, which, if you're old enough to remember, um, back in the 90s, she fell in a well, 18 months old, and um, CNN covered it live for, I think, nearly 18 hours while they re uh, rescued her from the well, and she ended up being fine. Um, but the other three are all from more local papers in Illinois, Galesburg, uh, Buffalo Grove, and, and Springfield is our state capital. The Sangamon County is, is there. And, you know, these are from 97, but uh, even back then, um, this didn't make national news. It didn't even make state news. So uh, these things happen more often than people realize. And, uh, again, they're just really a risk. And, we can't stress enough that you really need to seal any old wells that might be on your property. So for basic well care, um, one of the things that we certainly would recommend is if, if you don't, you know, some people uh, have the wherewithal uh, to work on their well and understand that and uh, do all the things they need to do. But if you're not comfortable working on your well or even disinfecting your well, then you should really uh, talk to a licensed well driller, pump installer, or contractor. Uh, to be sure that um, things are done right, things are serviced correctly, and things are put back correctly. Uh, one of the things that's recommended as a best practice for well care is anytime your well is opened, you should disinfect it because it's created an opportunity for bacteria to get in your well. Sometimes those things can grow in your well, and uh, then you'll you know, have issues uh, with bacteria in your water. So uh, the other thing you can do is, in most states, um, there's guides to rules relating to wells and, and, and those sorts of things. So um, it's some work for you, but especially if you're building a new house and you're going to put in a new well, uh, it's buyer beware, just like it is for a lot of things. So you're better off being informed, knowing the right questions to ask, um, all those things, and, so, and making sure that the folks drilling your well are doing their due diligence. So, um, you know, one of the things that we run across all the time, for instance, is we ask people, well, what about your well log? Well, I don't have my well log. 
Well, the well log's not on file with the state either. And so you sometimes you have trouble getting that information. You know, drilling's a business, and so the drillers compete for business. And so unless they need to give up their well logs, they don't. It's like it's how they know going into a particular area uh, how deep they're going to need to drill, what kind of water they can expect to find, and how deep, and all that sort of thing. Um, so one of the things I recommend is you become familiar with this if you're going to put in a well. And one of the things you have put into the contract with your driller is that they file, uh, they give you a copy of your well log, the geology, all the pump information, um, everything that would be on a typical well log, so that um, you have that. Uh, it's an investment. You know, some wells, um, Katie did a survey a few years ago. We called, I think, five or six random drillers in different states, different parts of the country, and asked them how much it would be for a particular well um, that's a certain depth, certain kind of casing into bedrock. And it varied from $6,000 in Missouri to over $25,000 in New Jersey. And so uh, not a big sample set there, but it lets you know, um, you know, $25,000 investment, that's um, – that's a very nice car. And so um, you need to protect that and have all the information you can so that if there are any issues, water quality or otherwise, uh, with your well, you've got all the information you need uh, when you try to deal with those things. So as far as basic well care at the site, you know, this is a nice uh, elevated well casing. Um, it looks pretty new. It's got a, a nice standard cap on it that's sealed. Um, so it needs to stay that way. Um, if it's got a vent, it needs to have a screen. It needs to be elevated so that there's no issues with ponding around the well. Um, you know, it needs to be accessible, and that means it shouldn't be um, right next to a building, underneath power lines. You shouldn't have trees growing around it where down the road, especially if you have a submersible pump, that a drill rig or a contractor's um, truck can't get over the well where it can pull your pump up. So, um, you know, and following code to make sure the annulus, which the annulus is the area between the casing and the outside of the well bore. So when they drill a well, this looks to be a five inch casing. Um, they may have drilled a seven inch hole so that the casing will fit. Well, that area between the two, uh, that inch or so on each side, uh, you fill with grout um, or something that's impermeable so that the well bore doesn't become a conduit for stuff on the surface to get down into your, your well down to the screen, if that's uh, if you have a screen or a below the casing, if it's a bedrock well. So just making sure, uh, one of the examples I can give you is growing up on a farm, we had a, a large yard and a riding mower, and we didn't have a well in our yard, but we had these posts that were uh, lining the circle drive. And I can't tell you how many of those I hit, bent, broke off, um, because I wasn't paying attention uh, as I was mowing as a teenager. And so I uh, got in trouble every time, but it still happened. And so when you have a well like this, uh, you need to inspect it. You know, we recommend at least once a year. Um, those sorts of things can happen. And if there's a crack in that casing, that allows uh, bugs, uh, other things to get in your well. We had a situation with one of the RCAP folks in Virginia where they called and said, hey, this well keeps coming back positive for uh, coliform bacteria, and we can't figure it out. It's in the middle of a yard. It's all by itself. There's nothing or nothing that could be causing this. You know, um, it's not the septic systems on the other side. There's no livestock, all that stuff. And so um, I asked them to send me a picture, and it turns out that maybe a, less than a foot away from the well was an 18-inch diameter tree. And so it was a PVC well just like this one is. And what had happened is that tree had grown, the roots got around the annulus, and eventually as they get big enough, uh, they've cracked the casing. And there's a lot of bugs uh, and bacteria uh, that are associated with tree roots, and that's what's going on. Is likely, um, I told them if they camered the well, put a camera down the well, or might even be able to see from the surface if they took the cap off, they were going to see the casing was either bent in and cracked, or there might even be roots sticking through. Um, that were causing the bacteria problems. So it's important to have nothing around your well is the bottom line. Um, you know, it's just like you don't put trees around your septic lines going out of your house because uh, taking those roots out and, and pegging your septic line uh, is 
expensive and a pain. And, you know, when, once they're there, they will always get in. So you need to take care of it. Um, so here's, this is from the Minnesota Department of Health, and I use them as an example a lot because their Department of Health um, has a lot of uh, resources, and they do a really good job of uh, giving information out to their well owners. And so um, we found, um, and as I go through this today, there'll be a couple places where we use their information. They really do provide a service to the folks in Minnesota. So this is just one example of setback distances that are required whenever you put in a new well and this is for Minnesota. So these numbers, the 35s and the 50 feet, might be different in your state, but most states have this information. So you can find out what the setback is and make sure that, you know, there's a new home going in right next to your house um, on a small lot. Well, they need to make sure that their septic, even if it's more than 50 feet from their well, it also needs to be more than 50 feet from your well. And, uh, you know, that's where, again, knowing the flow direction of the groundwater, if it's possible, and all those things all come into play. And um, you can seek advice, like, again, from a state agency, like a state geological survey um, or DNR or whatever organization it might be in your state, and they can uh, give you some advice on those things as well, or extension as well. But this is just meant to be um, to show everyone all the possible things that can affect the well. Um, you know, I, I was measuring wells uh, water levels in wells, and I went to these folks' house uh, to measure their water level, and I said, well, where's your well? And they said, oh, well, we we actually, it's underneath our garage. We had to, we didn't have any place else to put our garage, so um, we cut the casing off, and we have a pitless, and I mean, so they put a concrete pad over their well, basically. So there's no access. As soon as their pump fails or they have problems with their well, um, they're not going to be able to get to it, and that's just a complete lack of understanding of how their well works, where their pump's at, and all those sorts of things. So, you know, this stuff, you know, can really affect, it's going to cost them a lot of money someday. This is just the bottom half of that diagram. And again, you know, there's a lot of things that potentially could affect a well, especially a shallow well. And so um, it's just to help you be aware and understand um, that it's best if your well is in its own spot far away from any, you know, certainly livestock or any potential sources of contamination. Um, a little bit about your septic tank. Um, this is an example of a two-tank septic tank or two-compartment tank. So the house is on the left, um, and it comes into the septic tank. It's a dual tank, as I mentioned. And so the solids are falling to the bottom, and there's other stuff floating, and in the middle it can run through the second tank and then eventually out to a to a, um, a discharge field, if you will, that's been built. And this is a typical design. And um, the, the deal with this is you see on top of the ground here, this shows three access points. And um, your septic system is meant to be pumped to remove those solids. Eventually, um, your tank will fill up. And no matter what kind of, um, you know, we have this argument with folks every time we talk about adding bacteria or yeast or whatever to a septic tank uh, that it makes things work better. Uh, that's just not true. Um, if your system is functioning properly and you're managing it properly, it's meant to work with the natural bacteria from our bodies to do all the breakdown that it needs to do and all that sort of stuff. So the secret here is to maintain it and um, make sure that you pump out the solids when it needs it. And uh, there's information available uh, on how often that needs to be done. But your, your goal here is to keep all the solids in the tank so they don't get out in your absorption field and start plugging some of those perforated pipes. Uh, because once it fails, then that stuff will start coming up to the surface. Uh, it'll cause a wet spot or a green spot in your yard. Or worst case, uh, it completely clogs. And uh, you'll see it back up either into your basement or, or your if you have a finished basement with... Uh, you know, a toilet and that sort of stuff, it can back up that way as well. So um, the bottom line is you just need to manage your, your septic system just like you need to manage your well. And so as far as a to-do list um, for your septic tank, um, you want to keep the area around your tank and drain field open so that you can get to the inspection port and the manhole. Um, you know there's a way to inspect how, how much solids are in your tank. A professional can do that. Um, and you shouldn't have anything but grass around it. 
uh, certainly shouldn't pave over it. You shouldn't drive over it, all those sorts of things. The other thing you can do is, you know, the longer the bacteria in your septic tank have to work on uh, the material that comes into the septic tank, uh, the better it breaks those things down and the, the better it functions. So um, it's not recommended to have sump pumps, whirlpool, or even especially softener backwash uh, go directly into your uh, septic. It should be a separate system that discharges uh, somewhere else on your property. Um, and it uh, should go without saying, but, you know, only wastewater should go in your septic system. Garbage disposals, um, you may think that because it's natural material that a septic tank's going to break that down. That's not what happens. Um, usually, it, uh, I know, like Nessie, the National Environmental Services Center, says that if, you know, typically because of the size of your tank and the number of people that are using it, you should... Uh, pump your tank every four years, if you have a garbage disposal, then you should have that and make it every two years. It causes that much of a, of a solids buildup in your septic system. And again, no man-made stuff, paints, pills, um, you know, you have extra um, antibiotics from somebody having a cold and you put them down in your sink or your toilet, um, you're putting something that kills bacteria into your septic tank where bacteria are what break everything down. Um, so you want to keep that stuff out of your septic system if you can. Um, yeah, and I've already mentioned the other two here at the bottom. So I do want to mention um, EPA has a program called Septic Smart, and uh, they've been very aggressive the last several years on, um, well, it's been around for longer than that, but um, they've changed their website in the last year. They've added a bunch of materials, and I know they're working on a new uh, manual for homeowners, if you will. There's a lot of good information, and it's just, it's usepa.org, um, or, or .org, .gov, it might just be epa.gov, actually, um, slash septic will get you to this page, and you can Google that, too, and find it. But there's a lot of good information here on how to take care of your septic tank. Um, you know, there's a page here on how to care for your septic system. Um, from the homeowner's guide they have, here's, you know, one of the reasons why things fail. This is a really good slide because it talks about, you know, maybe uh, the bottom one here, improper design or installation, maybe the home was a small home that was built out in the country and there was just a, you know, grandma and a grandpa who lived there and so their septic system has a 500 gallon tank and it, or, or smaller and it wasn't really meant uh, for more than that. Someone else bought it, they've put on two or three additions, now there's six people living there. Um, you know, that's going to be a problem uh, for how often that needs to be pumped because it just can't handle that. And if you're not aware of the original size of the tank and some of those issues, um, it's going to end up clogging your septic field and you're going to end up putting a whole new system in. So, um, so there's just a lot of good information here uh, on what you should and shouldn't do. And I certainly recommend um, if you're maintaining your own septic system that you take a look at, at this information. So as far as testing, you know, the, the real premise here for a lot of things is that you need to test your water. That's the only way you can be assured that your water, well water is safe. Um, the vast majority of wells are pulling groundwater uh, that's fairly pristine and it's, it's healthy or it's at least safe. But there's no way to know that without testing. Uh, to be like my dad did and just assume it's better because it's groundwater, uh, is a mistake. There are naturally occurring contaminants, um, all those sorts of things. So uh, what's recommended is that you test annually for coliform and nitrate because those are indicators and I'll talk about that more in a minute. Um, but also anytime the well's opened or if there's anything you notice that's different. So you know we've seen issues with our monitoring wells here in Illinois uh, when there's been a small earthquake down in Missouri affecting water levels and changing things. So a lot of that stuff uh, you might not even count on or you know, you don't know what's going on with your neighbor, if they've uh, spilled something. There's just a lot of things you need to be aware of. And, um, you know, testing is the one way to, to take care of that. So, um, so what do you test for? Well, it really depends on your situation. I know that's uh, kind of a, a cop-out, if you will. But it depends on how deep your well is, where your water's coming from, and if there are any known contaminants. So um, go to your county, state, or local health department and ask them if they know of any issues. You know, in certain areas of the country, they're going to say, yes, we have an arsenic problem here. Um, it's naturally occurring. Um, you need, the only way to know for sure is to test for arsenic or might be some other contaminant. 
So um, talk to your state well record folks. They'll know your neighbors, your driller, um, co-op extension. Um, all of those folks can be a resource for you uh, to find out if there's anything you should be concerned with. Other things, if you have a shallow well that's a large diameter, then your water is likely coming from the water table. So it's more susceptible to any surface contamination. So if you're in an agricultural area, you know, you should certainly be concerned about nitrates. Or if um, you're in an area where it's karst topography, you know, the geology there, there's sinkholes and uh, fractured rock right at the surface that allows things in, you see a lot more contamination and more coliform uh, positives in those areas. So it's understanding the geology and your well construction, where your water's coming from, um, I don't think I go into it today in this presentation, but it's, you know, the difference between a bedrock well that's 200 feet deep and a sand and gravel well that's 200 feet deep is that the sand and gravel well has a screen at uh, the bottom, say, 5 to 10 feet. So if it's 200 feet deep, that means the water is coming through the screen from 190 or so down to 200 feet. But a bedrock well that's 200 feet deep may only have 30 feet of casing, or in some cases even less, if it's an older one that wasn't that doesn't meet code today. And so, um, because a bedrock uh, well uses the rock as the casing um, after you get to a certain depth. So usually you put in a casing uh, 10 or 15 feet into the rock and the rest of it's an open hole so that you can take advantage of the fractures that exist in the bedrock so water can seep in. But that also means if those fractures run back to the surface that you've got surface water that, that can actually run through those fractures and get in your well. So understanding those things uh, will help you also understand what you need to test for. Um, here's a couple examples of states that have done things to help you. So in uh, Massachusetts, their Department of Environmental Protection has set up this website. Um, there's a lot of uranium and arsenic in that area. And so uh, you can type in your address and it will tell you uh, you're more at risk or not of one of those, one or both of those things. And so it gives you a guide that says, yeah, I, you live at this address, you have a private well, you know, a lot of wells in this area have uh, high arsenic, so you might want to sample. So, um, okay. Another example, this is Rhode Island, and I like to show this one just because uh, there's two things they're showing on this map. One are the little circles that are all over. Those are old orchards where a lot of arsenic was used. So especially in the, the soils contaminated in those areas um, and the shallow groundwater is typically contaminated with arsenic in those areas. But the big splotch that's in the center third of the state is actually beryllium. And, um, and I mention this every time, but uh, beryllium is a regulated contaminant. It has health effects. It's not very common. Um, I didn't even realize it was uh, a regulated contaminant until I saw this map. But um, it just, you know, the idea here is it lets you know that if you live in this area, you probably should sample for beryllium and make sure that it's not over what the EPA says is safe. Um, so, and going back to that, you know, this, the arsenic standard is 10 for a community water supply. And I don't know what the beryllium standard is, but there is one. Um, your well could be over or under. Um, and whether you do anything about that, no one's going to come in and say, okay, you can or can't drink your water because it's over some limit that's completely on you uh, as a well owner. So um, that's why you need to do your due diligence and, and do your te do testing when you need to. Here's another example of a, of a newer site. Um, so the Wisconsin DNR is the agency that regulates private wells and community wells in the state. And they've taken all the groundwater data that they've got and had uh, Stevens Point, uh, University of Stevens Point, of uh, Wisconsin at Stevens Point, developed this GIS map. So I get on this website, I typed in, uh, or I clicked on arsenic by county, and it pulls up this map and shows me where there's arsenic that's high. You can see there's three red counties where the average arsenic value for the wells they've sampled in that county are over 20, and the standard's 10. Um, you can also see a lot of green there. I think that's green, I'm colorblind, um, where it's less than five. So, um, but if I'm moving to Wisconsin, especially that's the Green Bay area, I got a job there, whatever, and I'm going to buy a home with a private well, I know I'm going to, before I buy a house, I'm going to sample it for arsenic uh, if it's on a private well. So um, just a lot of things to be aware of, or if you live there, maybe had no idea, um, you can look at this uh, website and get an idea of what contaminants might be in that area. 
Okay, so here's what we suggest. And, you know, if you ask 10 different folks who are in this uh, business, if you will, um, what you should test for, you're going to probably get 10 different answers. But um, testing for coliform, uh, coliform bacteria and nitrate, they're fairly ubiquitous in the environment, and the idea here is they're cheap to test for. Coliform isn't even a health risk per se itself. It's E. coli that's really uh, what can cause health effects. But what coliform, it's an indicator of bacteria. Um, if you find coliform bacteria, that means there was a pathway into your well, the same way with nitrate. Um, because there's so much nitrate in our environment, especially shallow, um, because of all the farming and everything else that we use nitrate for and fertilizer, um, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, because of that, um, when you test, if you test for those things annually, um, if it gets elevated, you'll see um, what's going on. I mean, you'll you'll understand, uh, you'll know that you have some kind of uh, possible breach in your well. Um, this other list here are more um, inorganics and metals and things that could be a risk, depending on your piping, you know, galvanized pipe testing for, um, you know, pH and sulfate and some of those things give you an idea if your water might be corrosive. And just this gives you a general groundwater chemistry of your well. And the one example um, I usually mention here is groundwater, if it's, you know, I'm used to working mostly in sand and gravel uh, aquifer environments, but they're buried in a lot of cases. So they're confined aquifers that are uh, fairly deep and more than 100 feet below land surface. And I have uh, some monitoring wells where we sample them about every 10 years. And what I can tell you is, um, you know, eight, eight or 10 years ago, if the arsenic level in one of those wells was 35, when I go back there now and test again, it's going to be fairly close to that value. Um, the chemistry doesn't change. There hasn't been a lot of use in the aquifer there necessarily. Water moves slowly through the ground, though it does move. It's part of the hydrologic cycle. And you can count on groundwater being fairly consistent um, unless it's influenced by the surface. So, for instance, if, if uh, my pH has been 8 for the last 15 or 20 years and I go out and sample tomorrow and the pH is 6.5, um, that's a reason for concern. Something um, very much could have happened uh, to cause that issue. So, um, yeah, anyway, that's... That's what we recommend. And then lastly, you know, talk to your local county or state health department and ask them what they recommend. Um, there may be other things in the area or they may have reasons for you to sample for some um, other uh, constituents. And it's, uh, you know, they should be the experts as far as local information and be able to tell you um, if there are any other issues. So as far as where to get it analyzed, um, every state accredits labs. So um, what we recommend in general is that you should try to use one on that list. And uh, you can go to EPA's website and look up accredited labs uh, and get that information. Now, there are labs that aren't accredited that are still um, worth uh, using. I mention that because our lab is a university lab. And uh, we used to be accredited and we're not anymore just because of the uh, effort and uh, the money it took to do that, but we follow all the protocols and and and, and all those things. So the the real issue here is um, you should find out as much as you can about a lab before you decide to have a sample analyzed there, and they should be able to give you good information. Uh, you know, like today, uh, we're going to talk about um, why you might want to sample more than one place at your uh, home, and um, ask questions until you're satisfied. So they should be able to provide the bottles, um, uh, directions on how to collect the samples and how to make sure you don't contaminate yourself, all those sorts of things. Uh, and in some cases, I know in Pennsylvania when you're dealing with um, all the fracking issues, if you want a sample that's legally defensible, I believe you have to have the lab actually come out and take the sample themselves. And that's part of the process. So, you know, you need to you need to understand what you're going to use it for. Is it just for your information? Is there some issue that uh, you're concerned about? All those sorts of things matter. Now, as far as interpreting the results, um, I'm going to show you a website. I mentioned here you can use websites and documents online to get a sense of your results. But take it to your county or local health department and ask them uh, to give you a, their opinion on your sample results. And, you know, especially if something found uh, is really dangerous or a concern, 
one, don't drink it until you've resampled, but always resample. Um, it's worth it. Uh, sometimes labs make mistakes. Sometimes the way the sample is collected uh, causes the problem. And so it's worth um, being sure if you find something in your well. So, and if you sampled for coliform bacteria and not for E. coli, um, if you have a coliform positive, then you should test for E. coli. And don't drink your water until you can chlorinate it either way. But you need to make sure, um, you know, if it's going to be a health risk or not, or if it's uh, sometimes uh, coliform hit can happen for other reasons. So one of the a recently developed tool that's out there where you can put in your sample results um, was developed by the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services. And they had funding from CDC to develop this. It's a great tool. Um, you can, uh, it's for folks in New Hampshire, but anyone in the, st in the country can really use it. Um, and actually, we highlighted this at a conference, or we asked them to come talk at a conference where New Hampshire highlighted this. And a number of other states are considering using this uh, tool uh, in their state. So hopefully we'll see more of these uh, similar um, out there for folks around the country. But you click on the green button at the bottom, enter your well water test results. Um, I put in 15 micrograms per liter, which is, uh, you know, the one nice thing here is you click on the units and it gives you uh, milligrams per liter, micrograms per liter, parts per million, parts per billion. Well, milligrams per liter is parts per million and micrograms per liter is parts per billion. But your lab, uh, individual lab results may come back with any one of those. And so not understanding whether it's 15 or that would be, um, if it's in milligrams, you know, 15 is a tremendous amount of arsenic. And so making sure you have the units right uh, is really important. And for those of you who might have taken our class already, there's a pretest um, on uh, that asks a number of questions just to get an idea of how much you know about your well and some of those issues. Only 27% of the folks who've, of about 3,000 people who've taken our pretest have been able to convert the units correctly uh, on the question we ask about uh, units related to sample results. And that's important because um, you may think you don't have a problem when you really do, or you may think you have a really, uh, you, you may think you have a problem when you really don't um, if you get your units messed up. And so, you know, none of us like to do math. I know uh, I sure don't, but it's important to understand those differences. And this tool is an advantage because it kind of uh, makes it less likely that you're going to make a mistake on the units um, because it gives you all the options right there. So when I put that in and tell it to uh, tell me the results, it puts up uh, an X there and says the value exceeds the drinking water standard. Uh, the EPA has set 10 uh, parts per billion or micrograms per liter as the uh, health standard for arsenic for community water supply. They have to be below that or they're in violation. And again, as a private well owner, there are no rules that say it has to be. If you want to drink water that's 15 micrograms per liter of arsenic, you're more than welcome to as a well owner. Um, the other uh, improvement to past versions of some of these sorts of tools is this also talks about types of treatment. So here it's recommending either absorb absorptive media or um, reverse osmosis RO. And so it can give you information there. Um, you know, it even links to NSF, which a lot of the treatment devices have to be approved to take out a certain amount of uh, whatever contaminant they're supposed to be treating in order to be certified. And so it's a good way to get that information. Further down, it, it gives you uh, links to things uh, and provides uh, an, uh, an interpretation, so to speak, and even talks about how uh, arsenic can affect your health. And these are all standard things like from CDC that they've added in here. Um, but again, this thing's great to give you a sense of what your results are and maybe give you some background information so that when you do call your local or county health department um, or state health department, um, hopefully you can ask better questions. Because in the end, uh, you need to talk to a qualified health professional if you're concerned about anything in your well that might be a health risk. And uh, so that's why um, we certainly recommend you do that. Um, I probably already beat this to death, but you know, these are a guide. Uh, take your samples to a qualified person. Um, you know, health professionals are there to help you. They want to make sure that they're helping protect your health and your families. And uh, 
you know, I said here the third bullet, they can't tell you to stop drinking your water or condemn your well, but they can and they can only recommend it. And that's basically true in um, most of the country, but there are a few isolated local districts and counties where they've passed laws specifically for their county where um, that may not be the case. I know I met um, a person from a local health district in Massachusetts uh, in January, and she's actually has the ability to condemn wells, but it's only in her local health district. And there's 500, over 500 health districts in Massachusetts. And that's just because that particular health district decided to make that a, you know, an issue. But um, there are no state laws, and uh, there's just very few laws like that where that can happen. So, and if you're concerned about sharing your results with someone who might tell you um, that they want to condemn your well, then find out first, you know, what authority do they have? Um, but, you know, I want to be fair here, but the bottom line is we would recommend that you go to your local or county health department because their job is to help you make sure that you're being safe and your family safe. So um, we, we think you should use them. Um, as far as treatment, um, you know, the big issue here is uh, once you've identified a contaminant and you decide you need treatment, um, hopefully you've done that as a process with other folks that you trust to make those decisions. Um, then the, the most important thing you need to know is you have to maintain it. And uh, I actually had a state agency tell me they didn't want us to talk about treatment in our class um, because they found um, through the years that um, there were more private wells where the treatment devices weren't maintained and they became the source of contamination. Uh, versus those that were properly maintained and doing their job. So an example would be um, a filter that if it doesn't clog up so that water won't go through it, it can start harboring bacteria because there's a food source there um, or an RO unit that does the same thing. Um, that membrane can eventually clog up and become uh, a site for bacteria to grow and then now all of a sudden you've got bacteria in your water. So. Uh, the message here really is if there's a maintenance schedule or replacement schedule uh, for like an RO membrane or a filter um, or if it's some kind of um, granular material, uh, follow, the, follow what it says and, and do that. So um, that's all I have uh, related to um, kind of a canned presentation, if you will. We also received a number of questions from you all, and um, I said here we can't answer them all, so uh, especially if anybody just signed up in the last day or two, I might not have seen those. But um, yeah, we are developing a web page uh, that will have all this stuff, and uh, Katie's take, keeping track of any questions you might have today. So I'm going to get to the questions that we did have received, um, and these first few I'm going to let Dan answer. Dan, you're still with us, I hope? Yeah, I'm right here. All right, because these are really more um, water quality and chemistry related, and uh, okay. Dan's an expert there, and, and I'm not. So the first question we had was, what do I do if high levels of arsenic or contaminants are found in my water? Well, uh, let's just talk specifically about arsenic. Uh, usually you have to add some type of treatment. Reverse osmosis is a, probably the most common that, that we've seen in our lab. Um, and a lot of times it's pretty effective, but um, we have seen, and other, others will say this too, uh, in some situations it, it's not really a, too effective, um, and it seems to be uh, that the um, oxidation state of arsenic, is, it's dependent on the oxidation state. So they have uh, a plus three or arsenic three or arsenic five states, and when it, uh, if you oxidize the arsenic from arsenic three to arsenic five, uh, the reverse osmosis units seem to be uh, do a better job at removing the arsenic. I think the same thing can be said with um, some of the um, absorptive media, um, usually that's iron-based, but I also I think uh, when the arsenic is in the oxidized form, it's more easily removed. Um, just to, uh, to address just general contaminants, reverse osmosis is a pretty good option because it'll remove about 90% of the uh, dissolved material. Um, so it's a good starting point. It should be fairly cheap to install. Uh, a few hundred dollars as opposed to maybe a couple thousand dollars like for a softener, things like that. Um, and softeners aren't designed to remove arsenic anyway. So, All right, thanks. Yeah, it's interesting. They're not really 
meant to remove arsenic, but we've certainly seen in cases, uh, some cases where they have. And so you just yeah. don't know what you're going to get. Um, it seems like, yeah, in those cases where we've seen that happen, I've always kind of thought that it was likely like a co-precipitation with iron. Uh, it seems like when the iron goes down, a lot of times the arsenic also goes down. Uh, not 100% sure on that, but. That certainly works for community water supplies. Co-precipitates with iron, so. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right. Um, next question, that's also for you. Okay. Uh, the next question is, why is my bathtub become orange with water? Uh, I would say that's almost always due to iron. There are some other things that can cause orange colors, uh, but if it's, uh, typically it's iron, like 95% of the cases. The groundwater has a lot of um, iron uh, in it in many parts of the country. Uh, it dissolves from the minerals, and then when it is pumped up and it comes in contact with air, it oxidizes to, from the ferrous form to the ferric form. Uh, forming iron hydroxide typically, uh, which can then form iron oxides, and that those cause the orange color. Um, often uh, you can put a sediment filter in front uh, or after your pressure tank in front of any treatment. It will remove some of that precipitated iron, but a lot of people will still have iron present in the dissolved form. And in those cases, uh, your soft, a lot of people will use softeners, or they might add a they might add an iron filter, which has an oxidation media in it. Um, but softeners are, are often used, and they're usually pretty effective from what, we, what we've seen. Um, the, the iron is, goes through the ion exchange resin, just like uh, the rest of the water. And the, the iron ions, like the calcium and magnesium uh, hardness ions, um, can be exchanged out for sodium. Um, and I always recommend putting the uh, sediment filter ahead of it, uh, ahead of the softener, just to help um, keep the treatment um, in good condition and prevent the iron from following the ion exchange resin. Um, I, I guess some other things that water could be orange or brown, uh, I didn't really mention it here in this slide, but some places will have dissolved organic material, they, they call, are called tannins. Um, that stuff typically can't be removed with a sediment filter because it's, because it's dissolved, but they do make other treatment for that, and I would just talk to a dealer if you have that issue. All right. Um, here's another one. Go ahead, Dan. All right. So the next question is, there's a filter in a clear capsule near the water tank. How often should that be replaced? Well, it really depends on the type of filter it is. Uh, and you can look at the device and find out who manufactures it and uh, look at the model information and look it up and find out uh, what it's meant to do on the Internet. Um, and that should provide you with you know things you need to do the things you need to do to maintain uh, that device, and uh, you can also better understand what it's for. Um, if that information is not available, uh, then um, our guess would be that it's a, probably a sediment filter. Uh, the sediment filters typically need to be changed every few months, but in some cases you might have to change it more frequently. Um, sometimes uh, you can use the water pressure as an indicator if your filter needs to be changed. Uh, a typical size might be a five micron, sometimes people will use a uh, lower pore size if they're still seeing like small amounts of iron to get through they might uh, go to a, a lower pore size uh, filter you just basically watch the water pressure and and keep up with especially maintenance on this I think it'll be forced if you don't maintain it you'll see the water pressure drop oh yeah and here's a here's a good example of that this is a, a typical uh, sediment filter um, on the left-hand side, you can see that's a that's a new string-wound filter. I believe the pore size on this is five microns, and this is what it's like after uh, uh, I think two or three months worth of, of water running through it. Uh, the the sediment in this case, I believe, is mostly iron. It looks really black here, and usually black is associated with manganese. Um, manganese and iron are often go together anyway, so it's probably probably a mixture of both, but. We've seen some of these filters, like when they're black like this, after they dry out, the iron will, it'll turn more brownish, and um, therefore, I, we've also done some analysis on some of the sediment, and, and it's shown a lot of iron, so I, this is just a good example of, of what these will look like. Uh, if you just see the white turn a little bit yellow, it's you can let it go for lots longer. Some people will say, hey, i got to change these every, every other day, but that's probably not the case unless it gets to be this black. Okay, so um, 
Where to sample and why? When is it best to collect a water sample from a faucet in the house? And when is it best to sample at or near the well? Well, so um, oh, I'll go ahead and answer this. Uh, really, this is about what Dan does in our lab. We usually ask people to do both. Um, one, so that it's uh, like at the kitchen tap that's more of a drinking water sample, and one in an outside spigot that's more likely to be a, quote, groundwater sample um, before any kind of treatment. And the reason uh, for our needs um, as a groundwater hydrologist, I'm interested in what the groundwater quality is in a lot of cases, the natural occurring groundwater quality, so we know what we're starting with. But obviously as a well owner, you're interested in what you're drinking. And so by doing both, you get um, an appreciation for uh, what those both are, for one, but also how different the water can be from an outside tap and from your kitchen tap. Um, they can be significantly different, especially if you've added treatment or if you're in some areas of the country where the water might be a little corrosive, um, you've added, you know, you, where you start seeing some of those lead or copper problems and things like that. And so, um, you know, we do usually recommend that folks do both, uh, especially through our lab if you're doing that. And I'll just give you this one example. Um, this is one sample before any kind of treatment. You can see near the bottom on the right, it says the hardness is 351. Uh, the sodium's at 25.9, that's on the upper left, and the pH is 8.2. Well, then after the filter and the softener, um, we've lowered the hardness down to less than 1, and uh, the, but the sodium's gone up to 198. And this is a great example because if you're someone uh, on a low-sodium diet, then using a regular softener with uh, salt, uh, softener salt could be adding uh, a lot more sodium to your diet than, you're, uh, than you think. Now, this person also had an RO unit at their kitchen sink, and once they took a sample of that, um, you can see all those less than signs. That means um, those were undetectable values for all of those things. So it really does a really good job. The only, the only thing that's, uh, it, it did, the RO unit did do that um, isn't a concern in this case, but could be, is it lowered the pH from 8 to 6.2. Um, and that wouldn't be an issue unless you maybe had a whole house RO unit, and so then you've lowered the pH and it's running through the pipes in your house. So, but it's just a good example um, of, you know, what we would recommend there. And as far as well disinfection, um, you know, I'm not sure anyone asked this question this time, but I include it uh, on this presentation just because uh, we were asked this and we hear all the time how, well, I throw chlorine in my well once every spring or once a month I put a cup of chlorine in my well or, um, you know, a lot of different examples. It's actually a bad idea to put chlorine in your well unless you need to. And so the, really the only time you can disinfect your well is when you've sampled and it shows that you have bacteria. Um, and there's several reasons. One is that straight bleach is too con con concentrated and so it can affect the rubber seals and gaskets on your pitless or in your well or in your pump. And so um, we've looked at, you know, many, many different guides that have been developed on how to disinfect your well with chlorine. And the one we've settled on is this one from the Minnesota Department of Health. And it's a, you know, it's a, like an eight page document that it walks you through how to mix the bleach in a bucket uh, to a certain concentration so it's not too um, concentrated. And it also how much to put in based on the size of the well and the depth of the water and the depth of the well. It, you know, it, it, it walks you through the whole process. It has pictures. And we actually uh, have that on our website, a link to that. Um, there's a resources page where it lists resources for each of the 10 lessons. And under lesson 10, under water treatment solutions, you can see uh, one of the links is to this document. And it's free and publicly available. Um, as I said, as you go through this, it, it walks you through, uh, depending on the size of the well, how much to use. Um, it even talks about how, what to do about uh, if you have uh, some kind of treatment equipment and how to deal with that. Because, you know, putting a lot of chlorine through uh, some of the treatment equipment is probably not a good idea either. So, um, yeah. 
And there's a number of questions related to coliform. So we're just going to go through those. Uh, what do I do if coliform bacteria has been detected in my well? Well, you know, coliform itself isn't harmful. It indicates a pathway in your wells we already talked about. Um, so don't drink the water until you've tested it for E. coli. I do that next. And if you do have E. coli, um, then you, you need to treat it, obviously. But um, either way, if you have coliform bacteria uh, by itself, um, you you should you should still treat it, I guess. But if you have E. coli, then you need to make sure you're only using it for flushing your toilets, no showers, dishes, brushing teeth, um, because that can really cause a problem. And if it's just coliform, you probably can do those things. But I would disinfect your well. And once you've done that, uh, disinfected it, then test it again. And if it's been resolved, that's great. Um, but if not, then there may be a source of contamination that's continually able to get in your well, whether that be a crack in your casing or, um, you know, I mean, worst case scenario, we run into systems, uh, we run into wells where the well is right in the middle of a feedlot. And I'm not talking about a pasture with grass and, and cattle. I'm talking about a muddy feedlot with a high uh, concentration of cattle and it's a shallow dug and board well, a dug or board well, where there's, you know, there's no way that that well isn't going to continually be contaminated. And so if it's, that's the situation and there's some source influencing your well, then um, no matter what the cause, um, it, it'll require continuous disinfection uh, to maintain uh, some kind of level of, um, you know, either it's UV or chlorine. Uh, to make sure you're killing all the bacteria before it can cause a problem, or you're going to have to move your well, or the source, if you can. Um, so does a well ever need cleaning, and how often? So a well, you know, in general, many wells never get cleaned. They never need to. Um, they, you know, they're, they become a natural part of the system, unless there's some mineralogy or... Um, it's a type of well that, uh, you know, there's some kind of, if it's got a pH, it's either really high or really low where it's causing some kind of problem. You know, some well screens can clog up um, and become encrusted with minerals, for instance. Um, or uh, sometimes if it's a shallow well or a dug or bored well, maybe um, the gravel that's put around it has given way or there's a hole in the brick somewhere. And so you're starting to see things suspended or floating in the water. And in those cases, you definitely do need to have your well cleaned. And cleaning can be either chemical or uh, physical. And in the case of uh, some kind of incrustation, um, you know, there's ways to treat that with chemicals um, and also mechanically with brushes and stuff. Um, and what I recommend is that um, the National Groundwater Association um, has a website for well owners called wellowner.org. And on that uh, website, they have a residential well cleaning page that lists a lot more information than I can provide in this uh, answer here. And that's a lot to type out, I realize. Um, you can email us and we'll send that to you. Or you can just Google wellowner.org and well cleaning. And this page will be one of the top uh, results. And uh, so if you're, you know, if you're having an issue, you generally... Um, it's because you're losing, uh, you know, it's affecting the water flow or there's some kind of growth that something tastes different or it's turbid water that has something suspended in it. And usually there's a symptom um, for when something like that happens that might lead to you needing to uh, clean your well. And, you know, some people say cleaning the well and they really mean disinfecting. And what I'm talking about here is more than that. You know, disinfecting your well is... Uh, to me different than cleaning your well. So, um, so yeah, in 2015, I had coliform bacteria, no E. coli. I had my well cleaned, and the test came back clear afterward. Now, I'm assuming that means disinfected in this case. Uh, the person who did the testing sold uh, me a chlorine treatment device that drops a chlorine tablet every so often. Um, why, and is this really necessary? Well, um, it's only necessary to have continuous treatment like we've already mentioned when there's a constant source. So if you've only had coliform bacteria once and there's no constant source, and since you didn't have E. coli, I would suggest that's probably what's going on, um, you probably don't need to have continuous chlorine treatment. 
And regarding these chlorine tablet uh, devices that sit on top of your well and they drop a pellet down every so often, um, there's a number of states that have actually um, don't allow those anymore because um, they assume that a certain amount of water is being used and so the chlorine tablet is giving you a certain level of protection, but no one is using water consistently. Uh, you know, you're not pumping all the time two gallons a minute. Overnight, you're not pumping at all. When the shower's running, you might be pumping, you know, 10 gallons a minute. And so dropping a tablet on a pre-designed uh, timer uh, isn't providing you any kind of protection. And so um, what I recommend is uh, turning this thing off or letting it be empty so that it's not providing chlorine and then testing uh, a couple times once every, say, test a, a few weeks apart or a month apart and um, to give yourself some confidence that you don't have bacteria still in your well. Um, if you do, um, I would not use this device. I would use something different. I would use a continuous chlorine feed that's, you know, in your, in your basement, for instance, so that's the water that's actually going into the water line after your pressure tank, so um, you know that a certain amount of, uh, and they make those, that's what a community does, right? When they put water in the, before it goes out into the distribution line, um, they add a little bit of chlorine so that they can show that there's chlorine residual at the end. Um, if you don't like the taste of chlorine, UV systems have become more popular. Um, they do make them now for residential use. And, uh, yeah, and, you know, I'm guessing you're not going to have any issues, but um, before to, for my own peace of mind, um, I'd, I'd like to know more about your well. Um, before, you know, discussing this that much further. But it doesn't seem like, you know, that type of device is really that much of a benefit from uh, the way the industry's gone and the way the states have gone on that, what they require and don't and that sort of thing. So, um, and I, I know that when this question was asked, uh, it was just that the person recommended you do that to be safe. Um, I don't know that it actually provides any more uh, protection. Um, when you're just adding a, uh, a pellet every so often. So, okay, so the last one here, um, I think this is the last question. Um, I, and it's long, so I don't have much of an answer. They have a 175-gallon tank that they fill from their well, um, and they pump from the tank into the house. So they use chlorine bleach to sanitize the water. The United Nations says to use, you know, 8.25% pure chlorine, uh, one teaspoon for 16 gallons. So for their 175 gallon tank, they're putting in 11 teaspoons. They also have a triple, triple filter, uh, the water to the tank uh, before that, and then the, and the water's clear. Um, and they also have a one micron filter under the kitchen sink for their drinking water. So the question really is, what are, what are our thoughts on this? Um, and, you know, in some ways, this might seem a little bit like overkill, but it also... Um, what I'd want to know is take a sample of your water and does it have any chlorine residual in it? Because when you're adding chlorine continually like a community system does, it's so that in the end there's still chlorine, a little bit of chlorine in the water. That way you're sure that, you know, at the very end of the line, so to speak, it's, it still doesn't have a chance to grow bacteria. Um, you know, there's more information here that we could use. Like is the tank outside? Uh, in the sunlight, you know, is it a clear tank or a white tank or is it, you know, there's a lot of other information that would make a difference. Um, I know we had a well owner who didn't have uh, enough water in their dug well. They put a 1,000-gallon uh, tank um, next to their house and they put a pump on it and they were bringing water from town, uh, potable water, and it set outside and... Um, you know, having that sunlight on it and opening up the top to put water in is all it took for bacteria to grow in there. Um, and so there's a lot of, uh, you know, the, when you open that up, it was hot inside. So you're, you know, you've got a, yeah, there's just a lot of different things that could be going on. Um, but if you're concerned about whether this is safe or not, um, I would ask your local health department. So it does seem reasonable that you're adding chlorine so you're taking care of, uh, you know, the bacteria issues. 
but um, I think I would test for bacteria and test for chlorine. Uh, Dan, do you have any thoughts on that? Anything additional? Uh, no, I, I think what you said sounds really good. Uh, it seems reasonable. Um, I, as far as the exact dose of the chlorine, um, I think that if you search at, on the internet for CDC, I think they have a web page where they talk about cisterns and the amount of chlorine bleach to add. Seems like it might be around a cup per 10 gallons, but that that not, uh, that can't be right. Mm -hmm. um, I would just look it up. But, yeah. um, so, but anyway, they've got a good site that's that approaches it very similar to this. Okay. All right. I think that the other, I guess, on one other thought it, is is pretty. It should be pretty easy to test the chlorine level. I think some of those uh, like pool test kits. I'm not sure if they go to how sensitive they get, but I think they can get down to about a part per million of chlorine. I think they, I think they say you you probably want at least a half a part per million, maybe maybe one or two parts per million of chlorine, just as a guideline. All right, thank you. Um, so a little bit about the private well class. Um, I mentioned before it's 10 lessons. Um, if you go to privatewellclass.org, um, it's all free. So all this is funded through US EPA and RCAP, and so we're able to offer all of this information um, as kind of a public service. And so um, if you go to privatewellclass.org, there's a, an enrolling class at the top there in the green. And you click on that, and it takes you to this page where it really just asks for your email address, first name, and where you live. And the where you live is a drop down on what state you live in. And that's partly so that we can uh, show EPA that we're reaching folks all over the country. Um, if you're a well owner, you'd want to click on class instruction, every, emails every seven days. So what it does is it sends a lesson to you once a week to your email address. It's a PDF. It's between six and eight pages, and it walks through starting from here's how water flows through the ground and gets in your well all the way through lesson 10 is about treatment and things like that. So it's meant to be kind of a comprehensive look at what it means to be a well owner and the things you should be concerned about, um, and it walks you through all that stuff. So, And if you're a professional, uh, there's a button here that says Outreach Partnership. That's really signs you up for our newsletter that comes out once a month. And it isn't for well owners. It's really for those who serve them. So it's for drillers and EHPs. And, uh, you know, we reach out to realtors and home inspectors and uh, lab folks and, and all those folks that are working with well owners. It's more information that will help uh, them. Um, Extension is a big partner in a lot of this uh, cooperative extension service in different states. So uh, that's what that page is. This is the front page. Um, I guess I have those backwards, and you click on Learn by Email on the bottom left, or you can click on Enroll in Class at the top. We also have podcasts, which I, I don't think I have a, a slide for, but at least the first three lessons we have podcasts down and some other information um, if you're into that sort of thing. And then um, I mentioned that there's a resources library. So for lesson one, it's called The Science of Groundwater. Not only do you, uh, will we send you six or eight pages of material we developed, but then the, all of these other documents are all from state agencies, um, stakeholders in the groundwater industry or drillers, uh, not drillers, but like driller associations and things like that, that provide more information related to that same topic. So about groundwater hydrology, how it moves to the ground, how an aquifer works uh, for lesson one. And there's one of these for each of the 10 lessons. And it's under the lesson 10 one, if we could scroll down further, where that um, document from Minnesota Department of Health is for how to disinfect your well, properly disinfect your well. So um, we recorded all these webinars. So we did a webinar last August, a year ago August on lead, and that's on our webpage if you're interested in that, if you have a concern there. Um, but we record every webinar we do, and they're all on our website and through YouTube. And so there's probably 35 or so of those now. And um, so you can go through these uh, on different topics if you're interested. And again, some of these are repeated uh, as we reach new well owners. Uh, we also have a number of short videos. I think there's 16 of them on different topics that are five to seven minutes long. So uh, like this one is, how does my private well system work? Uh, there's one on how does my pressure tank work that's very popular. Um, what we've learned from all that is there's not a lot of information out there for well owners about their pressure tank, um, and also that there's a lot of people who have water pressure problems uh, with that have private wells. So 
Uh, it's just a short video, again, five to seven minutes long, uh, that kind of gives you the basics uh, to get you kind of on your feet to get started. So the goal of, you know, of our program overall is uh, to help well owners understand why their well is important, why they need to know how it works, and how they can help themselves protect themselves from risk. I said that twice. Um, and so we hope we've done that with this material. Um, there's also an on-the-ground program that we're partnering with RCAP, and they have staff in every state around the country. They're a technical assistance and training provider uh, that works with a lot of small communities and also with private well owners around the country. And so they put on face-to-face -face workshops. Um, there's an assessment tool that, the, uh, that we've developed for them that allows a uh, one-on-one. -on -one. If you have a concern about your well, they can come out and take a look and um, you know, assess what might be uh, risks related to your well and things like that. So um, the bottom line, this is really about being aware and you as a well owner need to understand your well log, where your water's coming from, so how deep it is, if you have a screen or not, um, all those sorts of things. And also, um, you know, what sources of risk you might actually have. Is there naturally occurring arsenic in my area or something else? And, you know, the goal here is for us to give you enough information that you learn to ask the right questions when you contact the folks in your area, like your extension person or your county or local health department person or state Department of Health. And the last thing is, you know, uh, sample your well. It's estimated that um, over two-thirds of well owners have never sampled their well. They've never had a problem, so they assume it's safe. And, uh, you know, it's just to your benefit, especially, um, you know, if you have family or grandkids or others who might be drinking your water, it's just good to, to have that confidence and know uh, what is or is not in your water to begin with. So um, I'm looking at what Katie's put up, and I'll throw that over here. Um, looks like there are no questions from you all today. So um, if you are looking for CEs, then you can email us what you need at info at privatewellclass.org. And uh, with that, I guess we are done for the day. So I appreciate everyone's time. Thanks for attending. If uh, something comes up uh, later, you can email us at this email address, and um, you'll get an email, I imagine, from us through GoToWebinar um, afterward, and you can always respond to that as well. So thank you, everyone, for your time, and uh, have a good day.